And here we are. This is uh, the Venice. We have today the satellite image in the middle and kind of a, just a random walk through things I wanted to remind myself to talk about today. You see the tourism, you see a cruise ship starting in the bottom left and going around. You see um, a, a canal in the furthest reaches of the northern lagoon where there's still the traditional fishing activities going on. You see what's happening, the re relics of the Madgari industrial zone on the lagoon perimeter. You see some important biodiversity. You see some traffic jam in a canal just the other day. And you see a last remaining resident <laughs> near where Elizabeth used to live with, also neighbours as well as colleagues. <laughs> and um, this is kind of an oversimplification, a uh, kind of general simplification of the lagoon today according to the human impacts. The, lagoon, the northern lagoon has relatively original characteristics and, and the natural dynamics in the system are fairly healthy. You know, the salt marsh, there's extensive salt marsh still, and within that salt marsh there's the natural self-preservation, reconstruction, resilience of, um, of, na of that's inherent in the salt marsh to allow them to stay and there's not dramatic erosion and loss of, loss of salt marsh cover. The central lagoon is, is dominated by the urban center of Venice and changes made in the 20th century like land reclamation and then the southern lagoon is still a natural environment even though the um, saltwater freshwater relationship has been dramatically altered since they um, first of all diverted the rivers and second of all the effects of the um, navigation channel, the Canale del Petrole, and the erosion has, has taken away a lot of the salt marsh elements. So people are always interested to know a bit more on, on, on what this really means for Venice, and this is coming closer to the, how my current project with Venice in Peril began, um, when, uh, first of all, back in um, 1999, 2000, the president of Venice in Peril said, you know, it, it's astounding that um, following the big flood in 1966, which was so um, dramatic and, and had such drastic consequences for Venice, um, it was before the decision to go ahead and build the mobile barriers had been made, and they said, you know, we need to help the Venetians make up their minds about what to do. Can we not apply some kind of ang Anglo-Saxon rigor to the decision-making process? And so that was the first project, whether they needed it or not. In fact, my first meeting with somebody in Magistrato Aleacque nearly sent me and my colleague from Cambridge out the door saying, we've had enough of this British colonialism and, and we also don't need any kind of extra high-level tourism in this city. <laughs> but but at, in, in retrospect, now that 10 years have passed, it, were, it was kind of helpful in, in putting some things, setting some things out clearly. And we did this huge, it, was, it took like five years to have a series of workshops with all the main research groups in Venice to find out what they know and what they didn't know about the lagoon system, which, by the way, is one of the most intensely studied lagoon systems in the world. You know, there's been an enormous amount of investment in research on the lagoon, although not always coordinated in a way that um, can make it significant for decision makers. Um, following that, that project, there was um, concern that there was another kind, and, and the, one of the main conclusions of that work was um, that even though the decision had meanwhile been taken to build the mobile barriers, and indeed they're building the mobile barriers, um, protection of Venice from extreme flooding was just one of the problems of Venice, and really there were a whole 
lot of other issues if you take a 360 degree view of, of, of the relationship between Venice and its, its lagoon that need to be taken into consideration like water, water quality, um, the ecological processes in the lagoon, the contamination in the sediments that are kind of a historic time bomb linked to intense industrial activities in the decades gone by, etc., etc. But then Venice in Peril wanted to know more about kind of the other kind of flooding that was happening in Venice. So um, from 2005 and, well, it, actually it was 2007 to 2009, more or less, we worked on this project called the Venice Report, which was looking at the kind of socio-economic dimension to the city and the flooding in terms of tourism, that of you know, how that was eroding the demography of the city and also changing the use of buildings, etc. And then at the end of that project, the kind of the, again, the trustees of Venice in Peril returned to the original work and they said, you know, I think it's really time to set out clearly the relationships between Venice and the lagoon because the environmentalists tend to think that it's, you know, the most important thing but people working in the city and in the port just kind of take the lagoon for granted and don't really see this. It's the same to them whether or not there's the lagoon. It's just an inconvenient space of water that needs to be crossed by boats or on a bus uh, across the bridge. Hence this, this project that I'm now working on, um, the title, which is the same title as this lecture, I think, that Why the Health of the Lagoon Has is important for the safeguarding the city. And here, after that not so quick aside, you see the water level trends in Venice. And the bottom thick um, line graph shows the steady growth in water level from the end of the 1800s when the first mechanical tide gauge was installed at Punta della Salute, you know, where the big round church is, um, up until now. And then, you know, it's there's, it's it's almost um, 30 centimetres higher than what was then the average zero m mark on the tide gauge. But what's more significant is the increase in events where water level goes above 80 centimetres relative to that tide gauge zero. And um, since the, the, the second half of the last century, that frequency has really increased dramatically by about 11 times since record began, whereas the extreme flooding frequency is more or less constant, you know, a big flood, you know, 140 centimetres or more, once every two to five years.